Welcome to Ozcast, the platform where we take a deep dive into the science and research behind the issues impacting Australian waterways. Each week, we team up with experts in their field to take a look below the surface. Ian, welcome to Ozcast. Pleasure. Um, you're surrounded by equipment here at the moment. Um, in a past life, you did get a bit musical. I, yep, I was a failed rock star 20 years ago, <laughs> Anna Branch on Spotify. Yeah, yeah there you go. There. It's a long jump from what we're going to talk about today, though. We're going to dive into the world of well, Freshwater Rivers, Murray-Darling Basin. It's a series that we've had um, ongoing here at Ozcast for a while, one that I don't think we can talk enough about. No. Um, obviously, coastal is super important and one that we will dive into. Uh, but today, it's going it's to be really about what some have described as the most important element in a healthy fishery, particularly the basin. Um, I think we're going to hopefully dive into, you know, the difference between, you know, the mandatories and, and the and the and the complementary measures, I think you described them, and I'm really keen to yeah. kind of pull that apart and, and get a better understanding about what is 100% required for a healthy fishery, yep. what is, you know, what's a good, you know, what's great. Would oh, be that, nice. Yeah, would be yeah. nice type. Yeah. And then, you know, maybe maybe – you know, in a perfect world, we can get to some of the other ones. I think those tiers are really important. Sometimes they're grouped together. Um, firstly, though, I uh, did meet you down in Mildura the last time we, we met face-to-face. We were at a forum, Yep. I guess similar to w- 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 how we find ourselves in Dubbo, the Native Fish Forum, um, and we had a good conversation down there, um, and we're actually on the banks of, of the Murray, Murray, Murray yeah. down there. So that's where you're based. <laughs> that's my patch, Mildura. Yeah. Mildura. So for those who aren't aware, um, might, might live elsewhere, up, up north or whatnot, give us a bit of a, you know, where does that kind of sit in terms of the basin? Yeah, so the Murray-Darling Basin is called such because it's essentially the catchments for the Murray River and the Darling River, right? Mm. Two big rivers, um, bread basket of Australia, all that, the fruit bowl of Australia. Um, and the Murray starts up in the Snowy Mountains, um, up past Albury, runs all the way west through to South Australia, out to sea and the Darling starts up in Queensland and comes all the way through a bunch of rivers all the way down through western New South Wales and it and it joins the Murray at a town called Wentworth, which is 20 minutes down the road from where I live. So um, fresh out of uni 25 years ago, probably more, I got a job out there as a, as a technician at a research lab mm-hmm. um, focusing on river ecology, fish ecology, and that's how I found myself in Mildura, met a local yep. girl and stayed. Stayed. Yep. Good town to live. It is good town to live. Yeah. I must admit, I was a, I was a fan. Yeah, I liked it. It was, had still had that that country, but it was the country vibe. But it was still a relatively big place. Yeah, it's growing too. Yeah, yep. I mean, people call it the oasis in the desert, and I get mm. that because it is very green, and you drive across the desert to get there. So. Yep. Yeah. How'd you find it? So obviously, you, I ask anyone sitting in that chair, how you find yourself in this chair? Why? Why has Ian been thrown under the bus by his colleagues? Is that the saying I use is, is to, to talk on a particular topic? Um, I've noticed in my experience that certain researchers accidentally find themselves in a particular field, yep. a focus point. Some people, you know, want to be there the whole time. So what's your story? How did you get to, <clears throat> I guess, someone talking on the basin? Well, it, it started off that job I mentioned that took me to mm. Mildura was just assisting with research projects and just a bright-eyed dude out of uni. Um, pretty cool place to go spend a couple of weeks here and there in boats putting fish nets out, catching fish, learning about different fish in the rivers, learning about what makes them tick. And after 10 or 15 years, you become an old dude rather than a young dude and you start to run your own projects. Uh, and ultimately, I, I wound up – I did that gig for 15, 20 years. Mm. Um, that lab closed down, that, that center, research centre closed down, but before then I'd sort of uh, been offered a job with New South Wales Fisheries to go and join their management team. It was actually run by Craig Copeland mm. at the time, so he was my boss. Um, learned a lot from that guy too. And that job was all about getting involved in um, advocating for native fish in the way we manage flows and water in the Murray-Darling Basin. And obviously there's this thing called the Basin Plan that was rolling out at the time. Um, you need some fish expertise in there to help the people who have their hands on the taps deliver water where it needs to go and they need to to make sure that they're providing what native fish need. Is so. it as simple as that? That analogy taps right. Like, is it is it quite? Have we got it to a point where we can literally direct water wherever we want it to go out it, of that river? In some places we can. It depends where you are. So it is. When I say taps, it, it's essentially it is like so. If if an irrigator orders water in the Murrumbidgee system halfway down, then it's got to be released from a dam, right? And there'll be a whole bunch of people out of water, but there'll also be requirements for towns. There'll be requirements for the river itself. And these days with the environment, so environmental water, 
um, they might order water that they want to use in a certain place. It's got to come from somewhere. So you can release water from dams and they're basically massive taps. But but there's a lag in places and there's also losses throughout a system. So it can take a long time to get water where it's needed and it can also um, it can be affected by a bunch of stuff on the way. Right. I find that so intriguing that you can order water, you know. It's a, to, to, for someone like yourself, it's you go, yeah, of course you can. But for someone who doesn't understand the process, you, mm. it's like buying a pie from a bakery. You go, okay, I need some water. Where are we going to get that from? Yep. We're going to take it from here, you so, know. So the individual users don't necessarily worry about that. Yeah. They, they farm, right? That's what mm. they're good at. And if they're an irrigated farmer... If they need to irrigate their crop, they need to irrigate their crop and they need to know that they can turn their pump on and there's water. So they they need to make orders or place orders or or, yep. or know that there's water in the river that if their licence says, well, you can you can extract when it's above a certain level, uh, there's different rules and conditions everywhere, but it's that's kind of how it works. And that's, wow. that underpins irrigated agriculture, which is a really important industry. So yep. you need that security, which is one of the reasons why go back 50, 100 years – Governments decided to do things like big, build big dams like Lake Hume or Bar and Juck, uh, and put weirs along rivers like the Murray River. It's got a whole bunch of weirs. Mm. They're called Lock One, Two, Three, all that stuff. And that that is to help moderate or regulate that flow as it's coming down. So a place like Mildura, you said it looks beautiful. It's always got this beautiful big river outside of it. Mm. Go back hundred years, that river would have gone up and down by five or six, ten meters, depending on the time of year. There's a big weir there now which basically stops the water flowing or holds it up and allows you to pull that water up. It's called a weir pool mm. um, and that means that if you are if you pump water, you know that There's gonna be most water of the there. time, yeah, your pump's going to suck water and you won't yep. have to put your pump up and down this really steep riverbank. So before we started to do that, Mildura would go, oh, great, we've got a, got a heap of water. How good's this? It's up, it, you know, fishing's great, got heaps of water, don't have to worry and then... In a couple of months' time, you go you go to the riverbed. Yep, and there's virtually all there. virtually nothing or really shallow. You can walk across it. There was a few few early droughts where there's, there's photographs, and Martin Mellon Cooper talks about this. Mm. That photograph of the the bloke with a foot either side of the Murray River, right? Um, mind you, by then there was already some irrigation development further upstream. So Mildura was sort of a, a utopian irrigation dream. Some California people came out and basically pumped water out of the river up into billabongs higher on the floodplain and then it could gravity feed across the landscape, which is why they chose Mildura for that spot. But when it was going down and up and down and up, that's its natural state. That's a natural flow regime, yeah. And surely the environment can cope with that. It loves that. The environment yeah. adapted to that over millions and millions yeah. of years. So this idea that we, we come in and see that and go, oh, no, inconsistency, we don't want that. That's just us being, you know, perfectionists. Well, it's, it's us. Well, probably capitalist is a better yeah, word. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, I mean, it's, it's across the globe. It's um, humans like to control things so that you can you can have a more predictable flow in this case, or a uh, more predictable power source, or whatever. And then, and then, I mean, half of the Murray Darling Basin is really arid. So if you want to if you want to irrigate that, and there used to be sayings like irrigate the desert or control the rivers in hindsight that was never going to happen but there are ways you could moderate the flow in a river to mean that it doesn't go murray river you get a spring rise snow melt spring and summer tend to be the wetter seasons and then it sort of drops back down at the end of summer mm. now it's kind of a bit more moderated which is great for irrigation industries because mm. um, it's secure and it's great for towns like mildura because it's secure and it's a tourist attraction Ecologically, we're now learning more and more. It's not so great, right? You, if you imagine that as an annual heartbeat, and then you flatten that heartbeat, then you're not getting the blood or the nutrients or whatever yep. you need and the oxygen where the patient Great analogy. Is. That's a really cool analogy. The fact that like when it goes up and down and you get these pulses, which give pulse in a range of different things, but when mm. it's when it's when it's flat, when that line on the machine in the hospital is flat, it's not doing its it's not diverse. It's not, it's not yeah. yeah. Yeah, wow. it's not diverse. And so, what, I guess the the one thing when I hear this conversation is right. It sounds like it's a bit of a someone's got to lose, mm. right? Someone's there's some group of people like you know conservationists and and fishermen and fisherwomen really. Well, they go, no, leave it how it was because they survived millions of years before it. Yep. Pe irrigators, 
towns, you know, just people might who, who might not be concerned with the river as much, they go, no, 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 what are you doing? It's what we is in. We like this river. We like how it looks. We yeah. like our Mildura. You know, I keep using that as an example. That's just going to be convenient for us, but there's towns all across the, the basin that are like this. So I guess we, you might be able to answer this later instead of now, but is there a sweet spot where we can please everyone? There's going to have to be. Well, I don't know if there'll be a spot that pleases everybody, mm. um, but we certainly, if, if we don't move towards a sweet spot and find one and everybody uh, everybody agrees rather than compromises, but agrees, Uncle Badger said that this morning and I liked it, mm. we can move to a better place, but if we don't, nature's probably going to force us there either, right. either way. Like I say, um, climate change suggests the rivers in the basin are going to be drier, they're going to have less runoff, and then they're going to have massive floods. We're going to go from one extreme to the other, right? Menindi fish kill is a classic example. What happens there? In the middle of a drought, a heap of fish died at Menindi. Four years later, right after a flood, a heap of fish died at Menindi. What? We're, we're ping-ponging back and forwards. Um, so if the rivers do get drier or, or more extreme and runoff is lower and hotter, then that's going to that's gonna exacerbate those negative impacts and nature's going to do it for us if we don't yep. take heed, I think. Um, I mentioned two groups of people before. We would consider ourselves in the former. The Well, I certainly consider myself as a fisherman but also as a, a conservationist. So let's chat about the former, which is basically uh, the importance of flow for for uh, fish, for our yeah. marine life, for, for that for that whole side of things. Not so much for our, our irrigators but for the for the things that live inside that river. So, look, there's a, there's a whole topic here and we're going to dive into it. But I think the most important thing to start with is is what is flow? Because to me, it's, you know, it's a four-letter word. It's yep. quite self-explanatory. We all know what when something flows. like it's, yep. But but it's got to be more complex it, than that. Yeah, it's an interesting one to, to define. And when you, in my world, it's really obvious what I mean. But when I refer to flow, I don't just mean getting water from A to B or water sitting at A or B. It's the movement of the water. And if you think like a fish, water flowing through a river, it's um, it's going faster on the outside of a bend, slow on the inside of a bend, you get eddies, you get all those turbulent bits behind rocks and snags. That's flow. That's flowing water habitat. Martin Mellon Cooper refers to it as lotic habitat. The opposite is lentic habitat, which is kind of a swimming pool, right? Not flowing anywhere. It's the movement of the water that pushes goodies through a river system or that brings in the high flow, which is part of the flow regime, picks up stuff off the floodplain and brings it in, which starts dissolving more goodies. It brings food into the system and it also provides places for fish. If, like, a fish can sit looking upstream and use barely any energy just to stay in the one spot. But if it's not flowing, it's got to have to keep moving around, right? If you're a big fat Murray cod, your ideal spot is sitting in the flow, pointing upstream behind a snag and you can ambush food, ambush food coming past. Doesn't take a lot of energy. Um, Mm. That's what flow is to a fish. It's it's basically like air to us or tides to fish that live on coastal rivers. It's different patterns of water movement, which they've become accustomed to and adapted to over millions of years, and they're reliant on those flows in some cases for cues to move around. Mm -hmm. um, golden perch and sometimes silver perch often won't breed unless they get an increase in the flow rate. So you go from a sort of a, a moderate flow, pretending there's no weirs in the river, down the bottom of the river, the, like it's a metre or two deep, all of a sudden over a week it comes right up to bank full. That might be a cue for golden perch to go, let's get on, let's go, move upstream, spawn, because the way they spawn, they just spit the eggs out, the eggs are fertilised by the males, and then they're just drifting downstream. The parents don't do anything else with them. And that flow is necessary to take those eggs a long way downstream. The eggs will develop as they drift, there's all goodies in that water, so when the eggs hatch, the little babies have something to eat and they'll drift downstream and they might land in a wetland or a lake or they might just stay in the river channel. depends where the flow takes them. And it's sort of a roll of the dice thing and if you land in a good spot, you'll grow faster. You've got a better chance of surviving to this big. Mm. You're over the hump then. That's the hardest bit, getting from this big to this big. Beyond that, the next time there's a flow, it might be the one that you surf at bit further downstream or it might be the one that cues you to go back upstream and recolonize where you came from the way you're talking about flow there though mate you know the next time there is a flow the next time you have this flow that flow so it's not just this constant no. 
So this idea that flow, a flowing river is one that just constantly flows and it does forever, there's cycles of flow. There's periods of good flow, slow flow, but that's natural. There's So thinking about it, if there's if you've had a flood and then all that water is flowing back off the plains, that's a, that's a type of flow. Yep. Um, I think what I'm getting at is this idea of flow, which I hear so much, is nearly oversimplified. Yeah, we probably should probably should revise that and call it flow flow variability or something, hey? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, like, I'm just yeah, I'm clutching right. at straws here, but no, nah, it's a it's a typical nerd thing to to use one definition of a word that most of the population they don't really understand what you yep. mean, and yeah, you know, it's good to be reminded. But mm. it, that's exactly right. So. Um, the life of a of a fish in the Murray Darling Basin is dictated by what we call base flows, which are a small flow, rises, drops, all that stuff. Right, the river going up and down, and like fisher people hate it, but there's a thing called a hydrograph, which is just a long term graph of what a river's done over ten years or twenty years or a hundred years. Why do they hate it? Because it's just a big line that goes. Right. Doesn't really mean much yeah. to them. Yep. But if you explain to them, if you were standing on the side of that river. And watching it for a hundred years, and watching the water level come up and down, and that's mm. what the trace is, right? And then if you look at a lot of our rivers for the last twenty to forty years, instead of doing this, they just go, and that's a flood. Yeah, the flood might get yeah, through because yeah, we yeah. can't capture it all. Yeah, but otherwise it's flat line. So the Mildura is another good example. You're sitting in a weir pool. If you have a beer or a coffee at Mildura, that water level is pretty consistent year round, right? It's right on the edge of the river. There's rowing clubs. Um, there's caravan parks right up to the edge. Mm-hmm. Um, before there was a weir just downstream. Before that was built, it would go up and down five or ten meters every year. Yeah, so you're not you're not building anywhere near that. No, and that, which means you've got a very slow moving body of water that's probably fifty kilometers long. Yep. It's not flowing dynamically. It's essentially a big fat swimming pool, which is mm. really good if you're a carp because you're evolved in that kind of place. And it's really good if you're blue-green algae because you don't have a lot of turbulence mixing you up. You can actually form a big colony and sort of Mm -hmm. dominate on the surface of the water. And it's not real good if you're a a tiny native fish that's reliant on a a flow, on the turbulence, to to carry you downstream because you hit the weir pool and you're probably just going to sink because there's nothing keeping you in the flow. So you mentioned their base flows. So that's like, that's the... I think the name says it, but it's the baseline it's of the baseline. It's the baseline. Then, is there is there tiers? Is there other types of flow that you sometimes refer to that are still equally important? Yep, there are, and um, and this is some of this is the common language yep. of river management. So, you get um, below base flows. There's essentially a cease to flow, which is when a river stops flowing and you just have pools of water here and there. Uh, and there are rivers that do that regularly. We call them ephemeral, right? They're not flowing all the time. Um, but a lot of the bigger rivers that are perennial, which means flowing all year, every year, you got your base flow, which is what it just does it when there's not a lot of rainfall upstream. There's things that we refer to as, as large or small freshes or flows or whatever, which is basically a pulse that comes down. So you imagine there's a rain event, 100 k's upstream, pretty decent one. Well, a week later, that will result in water flowing down whatever tributary it rained on into that river, into the next river, and then a pulse will go down the stream, right? That's what rainfall does. If it rains across a whole bunch of rivers in a catchment, and I'm thinking, um, just say the nor- northern Murray-Darling Basin, you've got the Bow and Darling, the Darling, which is the major river, but you've got the Namoy Valley, the Guida Valley, the McIntyre. Most people won't know what these are, mm. but if they live in them, they will. Like, oh, yep. that's my river. Yep, yep. All these rivers in Queensland, if you get a big storm or a cyclone event that makes rain for a week, like we had a few years ago, across all of those catchments, then at any one time they're going to be feeding water into the big river, which is the Bow and Darling, and you might get a large fresh. And if it's big enough, it'll break its banks and flood. And if it's real big, it'll go really wide. Is that making all the way down there? Those bigger floods do, yeah. And um, and if it keeps raining, then it keeps coming. But in a regular year nowadays, the way we manage the rivers, um, and if you think about coming out of the last drought, most of the, the big storages, the big dams like Hume and Barrenjo, yeah. pretty low. But most of the water had been used or released to maintain flows or for growing stuff. When it rains, the first time it rains and water starts running off the mountains into those big dams, 
they basically you capture that or most of it and you start filling the dam up again because next drought that's your security blanket but if it rains and your dam's full it's got to go somewhere so that's when they call it a spill from a dam mm. and that's essentially the beginning of flooding most years these days we don't get to that level um, every five or ten years in the southern basin we'll get a big flood which means there's unregulated spillage and flows um, but in a normal year if uh, if if the rivers are under control and we can capture rainfall in the big dams and then just moderate the releases mm. that's what we do um, we're trying to inject a bit more variability into it in the last 10 or 20 years because of the recognition of the importance of that flow variability that just a constant flat line not particularly healthy but if we can inject a few of those large pulses or small pulses if we don't have a lot of water and mm. a lot of this happens using environmental allocations we can put a pulse down a river and it'll help ger generate some fish food for babies some plankton yeah or it might inundate a few extra snags in a section that Murray Cod need to nest under them. And that's the kind of variability in terms of vertical height that you're thinking of. Mm -hmm. But if you're thinking like a fish, it's not really much the vertical height. They're sensing the different velocities. Yep. They're going to the bits of the river that suit their species or them as a fish. Right. So that's when it comes that variability you're talking about. So let's say you had a constant amount of water coming down, but yep. the river bends, it turns, there's rock bars, there's snags, there's yep. going to be a variable amount of velocity hitting that. And those fish, because they're native and they know how it all works, they're going to find the area that suits them and then that, that's their that's their spot. Spot on, it's dynamic. That, that's, the, that's what we need. It's not just this idea of having, oh, we need this constant. It's not like I want that, you know, chuck a bit of bark in the water and yep. it flows the same speed the whole way down the whole yep. river. It's, it's about, okay, mixing, like, in, in, there's a pulse here it's, it's it's okay we have a bit of a pool now because we've got a rain coming that provides it it's all about mixing it up to make sure that that river is just not stagnant that's it that's right that's ecology that's yep. called dynamic right yep. and a, a coral reef you have the clownfish in this certain areas you've got the big fish swimming around the sides you've got turtles coming through it mm. there's different niches within one larger ecosystem right? yep jungles you've got stuff in the trees stuff under the dirt stuff it's it's the same in a river. You've got those different little habitats. We just can't see them. But we know that fish are using these yeah. different habitats and snails and mussels and all that stuff. I think it's hard with flow because mainstream media, which is what I like to call it every now and then, where it just be our, 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 our wreck anglers, the ones that are writing articles, the catching big fish on social media and that, mm. you can't, you don't cast at flow. You know, you're not seeing flow. You're not seeing... Like, uh, well, I do you? Well, do you? That uh, exactly, exactly. It, yeah, I get they're fishing in back eddies and they're fishing on pressure points, and yep. and whilst those anglers know they're doing that for a reason, I think it, the reason flow might fall under the radar a little yep. bit is because it's not that big sexy snag in the water. You know, it's and not it, it's not that big rock bar that you're fishing with. It's it's the uh, it's like it's more of these. You know, they complement them if that makes sense. They do, and it, but it's also what makes that snag sexy. Right, take the same snag in a in a weir pool mm. that's not flowing, or put it in a bit of free flowing river with outside of a weir pool. It's going to look a whole lot sexier yep. to a, a big old Murray cod want to sit behind that well, one. Well, let's explain why. Right, so, you know, let, let, let's pull apart a bit of a river, right? So if we've got you know a bit of bit of fast flowing river, yep, got a big root ball in the middle of it, yep. got some branches coming off. Yep. Let's talk about what flow does. How flow changes just a what a stump to now being bloody good habitat. So, yeah, you've now got a if – you're, if you're tired and you want to rest in that flowing river, you go behind the stump, get out of the flow, take some shelter, catch your breath. Uh, if you want somewhere to lay eggs in a nest, Murray Cod lay eggs in a nest, if you just stick them on the wall where flow is going to come and scour them, they're going to go. You need to find somewhere sheltered. Um, if you want a bit of shelter from the birds above that are coming to get you and you're a little bony brim, Get in amongst those snags. It's harder to dive bomb in amongst a snag, but it also means there's probably a cod underneath there, out of the flow, saving its energy, ready to snap you. So that snag goes from just being a lump of wood in the water to being a multitude of microhabitats. Not not just for the fish. I'll come back to that, but places to hide from predators, places for predators to hide, places to live and nest, places to feed because the snags are covered in slime, biofilm which is essentially turning dissolved nutrients into 
micro bugs, plankton, big bugs, which feed little fish, which feed big fish, which feed birds. So that snag becomes a whole dynamic, a city rather than a, mm. just, a, just a, a hole in the ground to live in. But the reason it's coming a city is because the flow is providing it. With. The dynamics. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you put the snag there, well, it itself isn't doing much. It's what the water is providing yep. it. It is, yep. Mm. Uh, and it it seems obvious to me, but clearly it's that's one of those things that mm. we've got to get better explaining that um, if it's not dynamic, don't expect a dynamic food web. Yep. Or don't expect... Uh, um, a whole lot of species to live there. Mm. Like, Would you compare it to one of the things I'm going to compare it to, which might be some of our coastal kind of listeners um, a little bit more down their lane. It's like, for example, salt marsh for me, right? Yep. Salt marsh for me is one of those ones that I look at and go, surely nothing lives in that. You know, it's like it's it looks terrible. It's mm. just shallow water with grass and rushes and things like that. But it wasn't until I heard more about it and, you know, through people like yourself in the equivalent industry in coastal, where they go, no, salt marsh is is variable because you've got high tides coming in. You've got king, king tides covering it with water and then draining it all off. And, yeah. then, and then you've got sun bleaching it and soaking it and giving it that, you know, all that oxygen up there. So it's that, again, it's that idea of variability. It's, it seems to be that the key the key thing we, we're really looking for in all of our fish habitats is, you know, dynamic or variability. Yep. Which, that you know, that, that sounds like yourself. You're going, yep, but it's like, well, that's... That's probably not the one that we've, we haven't nailed that on the head. You know? No, we haven't. And um, probably a good one to, example to jump to from the salt marsh idea is like, everyone's heard of the Benindi Lakes. Not mm. many people have been there. There, there are a massive series of lakes on the Darling River. <clears throat> one of them's fifteen kilometres wide. If you put that on Sydney, you would go from the rocks past Parramatta. Right? It's massive, big round thing, probably only five metres deep. Shallow, warm in the desert. Like a tide, a high flow coming down the Darling will push water into these lakes, traditionally, right, and bring goodies and baby fish with it. But then that all would do their thing and then the water would flow back out once the pulse was gone past and these things would dry up partially or fully, uh, like the salt marsh, the high tide, go mm -hmm. to the low tide. And that's good because it means the dry sediments do funky, cool chemical stuff and consolidate and plankton put little... Uh, dormant pods back into the dirt so the next time the flow comes in or the tide comes in and it fills them up, you get another burst of goodies, right? Yeah. And the cycle continues. It goes wet, dry, wet, dry. That's where the salt marsh does. That's where yabbies in marine systems, that's where a lot of birds, wading birds, are going to get their food. They are dynamic and they're productive, but mm -hmm. only because of that variability. Up and down, up and down. down. Yeah. Rivers need to do that. It's like breathing. It's, um, it, it, it sounds simple because it is. But it's, yep. it's really hard to achieve these days because we've got a lot of different uses for water and um, water going past one point will be seen as wasted by some of the people upstream of that point. Yep. Water going out to sea from the bottom of the Murray-Darling Basin out past the Coorong, a lot of people go, that's wasted water. Or not if you buy prawns from South Australia or you like to go snapper fishing yep. in, in that part of the world. Like the, the goodies coming out of the rivers into the ocean – same as your coastal rivers, they're not as long, but they do the same thing. They're an interface between land So is, is there quite literally a mindset of, of, of let's use all the water in the Murray-Darling Basin? Not by everybody. No. But there are, yeah, definitely. And early on, that's definitely like the, the early propositions by early um, politicians, federation back then were like, well, let's let's green the desert. Let's, um, let's control the rivers. Let's... Let's turn the waters inland. The whole Bradfield scheme, which is just pie in the sky idea about Queensland rivers coming mm. down. They're all based on the mentality that, oh, uh, well, you are humans, we can conquer nature and we can make it bow to our demands and we'll make a living off it, right? At some point, that's not going to work, particularly in Australia, which is pretty nutrient poor. It's variable, it's dry. I mean, we've done all right with early grazing, we've done all right with some early cropping, now we're doing all right with some irrigation. But ultimately, yeah, like we do treat it as a resource rather than a living ecosystem generally. Yep. And that's how most people think about rivers. That's how we think about oceans. Um, the danger there is if you get complacent before you know it, mm. you think you're in decline, Eco ecological decline. You start losing species. Um, rivers are probably 
more at risk because most of the stuff going on under the water, we don't see it until wreck fishers just go, hey, it's not as easy to catch a fish anymore. Well, yeah. Grandpa <laughs> says there were heaps here. Mm. Well, yeah, there probably were. How much do you buy into that? How much do you buy into some of the stories you hear of the, the basin and to what it was and, you know, this idea, it was clear, this idea that you could, you know, you could walk across certain species like that? Yeah, I, well, I agree with most of it. Um, context is often important. Yeah. But in terms of the, the sheer number of fish that used to persist in these rivers was massive, depending on what part of the cycle. Like in a drought, obviously things, it's boom and bust, right? We talk about boom and bust. That just means when the rivers are flowing, which is most years, you get a high flow, that's your boom. And then it contracts, boom, bust. Over a thousand years, pretty stable, right? Um, you add all the changes we've had, the big storage dams that catch flow before it even flows through a river, the weirs that regulate the flow, extraction, um, carp, massive problem in Modong Basin. They're mm. basically soaking up 80% of the resources that native fish should have and they have an impact on water quality. All these changes over the last 150, 200 years have have had massive continue ongoing decline. And in my career, I've seen decline in certain species in certain areas, which means over 150 years, if if Grandpa says it was better back then, I believe him. But 150 Absolutely. years is nothing, really. It's uh, it's nothing in the in geological the- time scale. Aboriginal people have been here for 60,000 years or more. Cambodia have been dealing with, like, have been living alongside their river for 3,000. Yep, 60,000. 60,000 here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, like there was a great talk today by Uncle Badger and his wife Sarah about traditional fish traps. Yeah. And they were rock structures. Everyone knows the mm. Brewarana one. There's loads of these and most of them got broken up and used as weirs by us um, or blown up so riverboats could go through. But they were harvesting fish as needed no more than they needed for 60,000 years. The pyramids are only 5,000 years old in Egypt. Yeah, that's so, ridiculous. When you put it in perspective like that, oh, it's it? massive. And, and um, But that was, even that 60,000 years is not very long when you think golden perch have been swimming around for 5 million, 10 million years, right? So I, I do this thing where I get people to imagine a, a tape measure that goes for 100 kilometres where every millimetre is equal to a year of time. Mm-hmm. So a metre, 1,000 millimetres, is a 1,000 years. Mm-hmm. And a kilometre is a million years. Trust me, I did the maths. Mm-hmm. Right. So dinosaurs died 65 kilometres down that tape measure. Yep. Golden perch, Murray cod, start to be things 5 to 10 kilometres down that tape measure. Aboriginal people, 60 metres down the tape measure. Pyramids, 5 metres. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, 2 metres. That's barely from me to you. Mm. Europeans colonised and started uh, regulating the rivers 250 years ago, 25 centimetres, right? Carp, weirs, dams, extraction, de-snagging, forest land clearing, riparian clearing, grazing, all that stuff in the last 25 centimetres. And evolution works over thousands, if not millions of years. So fish cannot adapt in 25 centimetres to something that's taken them five kilometres to get to the point where they are now. Do you think of that, that whole system yourself? Yeah, it's brilliant. Is it? Yeah, as a, as a way to. I'm glad I said that. A, <laughs> that as a way to to explain it to someone, how how that you know the changes that we've made to our rivers. Yeah. To to put it down, you know, you could talk about your 25 centimeters compared to what was it, 100 kilometers. Yep. Brilliant. So let's let's you know let's talk about those 25 centimeters a little bit. You mentioned five or six of the big ones there. Uh, empowerments. Yep. Flow related. Flow related. Yep. Um, basically, we, pumping pumping water or ir- irrigation. Yep. Flow related. Takes the top off a of flow. Yep. Yep. Um, de-snagging. Yep. Flow related. In terms of variability, because surely snags and, and they, they stop flow back at is what we spoke about yep. before, right? Yep. Probably flow related from the fish's point of view. Yep. It's not going to dr- – oh. Won't affect the actual. So it's, let's, yeah. let's put it down here then. It's it's yep. one of it's still yep. flow related, but Fair it's a little cool. bit further down. Yep. Um, just coming back to that idea of you know dynamics, yep. weirs. Yep. So then weirs flow related massively. Extraction yep. barriers to movement. Yep. Uh, roads, bridges, yeah, all that stuff. All that stuff. So when you when you actually break it down and you go right within that last twenty five centimeters, what have we done? Oh, we've done X, Y, and Z. Yep. 
every single one of them, whilst it's done other things too, it's impacted flow in that river. It's altered the flow regime. If, yeah. if people get nothing else out of my gas bagging, the term altered flow regime. And imagine a, a river that used to go up and down every year, sometimes real high, sometimes real low, might even stop. Mm. Darling's a great example. As opposed to a river that's the Murray is a flat line in the lower stretch, it's the lower 1,000 kilometres. It's a flat line at a certain level. When there is a flood, you get a bump, and then it's flat, then boom, instead of this up and down yep. 10 metres. And the Darling, it's different because it goes, doesn't just go up and down, it goes up, flat lines, stops. Up, comes down, flat lines for a bit, stops. The stopping is not normal. The Darling did used to stop flowing quite a lot, or at least it got very low. Back then, they probably thought if a riverboat couldn't go upstream, it's not flowing, right? Recorded as not flowing. It didn't stop for a year and a half or two years, which is what we've seen twice in the last 10 years in the Darling. Fish kills. Fish kills are a result. It's not a resilient system anymore. It's not getting that variability. So when you say stop, so you might say back then they defined stopped as, I oh, can't get a boat up there. Oh, yeah, or just really yeah. low flow. It's yeah. like 10 megs a day or yeah. 50 megs a day. That brings me to so how much, I'm not sure how much historical evidence you have, particularly in your brain right now, but, you know, what what's some what's been the worst period for flow in the basin? Do it, like it, it would be in the last twenty five centimeters if we're calling it that. Surely, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, not necessarily because of a particular event or a particular year was the worst. And and by all reports, the Federation drought, which was nineteen thirteen or fifteen, mm. pretty nasty one, right? There's good records of how bad that was. That was before big dams. That was before weirs. It was natural. It was natural. There was a little bit of extraction, but it's pretty much that was a natural one, right? And it was a nasty one. But the year before and the year before that, variability, variability, like pulses for yellow belly to move around, Murray cod breeding, recruitment. You've got a, you've got a fish from ten years down to one year old, right? And then you have this drought, knocks everything on its on its butt for a bit, and but then after the drought, it's variable again, and then another five years later, maybe another drought, maybe flood. The last 20 years, in particular, in the Darling I'm talking about now, and it's pretty obvious to see when you draw those hydrographs, you've got a flood and then you've got a little flow and then it stops. And then you get a flood. And whatever survived that dry period, no, we'll breed, let's have a go. And then two years later, it stops again, which means everything that's two years old is probably going to die, or most of them are. So the flood, you take a step forward, and then there's another one, another drought or another dry spill because there's no flow coming down from the north, you take three steps back. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we're doing in the Darling and my job as the recovery coordinator. We had those fish kills in 2018, 2019, loads of fish died, but there are enough refuge pools. Ozfish played a part yeah. here. That some fish survived. And then when the flows returned, we had three really good years. Fish went nuts. Yellow belly everywhere from this big to this big to yep. this big. Murray cod. Larvae, juveniles, three good years. We've got three years plus the dinosaurs that survived the last mm. fish kill because they were in the right spot. We've now just had another fish kill, so two or three years of hard work to some extent will be undone. We don't know yet, but it means we're doing good. We're doing the right things. We're putting habitat back in. We're managing environmental flows specifically to help fish breed mm. and to help the babies survive to this big, then this big. We're trying to address fish passage so that they don't get stuck. Yeah. And then bang, one extreme to the other. We've got to start again. What's the best year you have had in your time? In my time? Is there a period where they go, oh, I had the golden years, you know, even though they're not, I, you know. But last year and the year before, I called it the year of the, the golden perch, right? Good years. Good years, right. So we had uh, good flows for two or three years in a row. And when I say good flows, variable flows. Mm. We had rises coming through spring and summer, which is the cue to fish to get busy, get upstream or get ready to spawn. Yep. Um, we had high flows through spring, which is when Murray cod want to spawn, which means there's plenty of nesting sites because everything's underwater, right? And then we had plenty of food in the system because some minor overbank flooding brings the goodies in, so all the babies have got plenty of food. So if a female yellow belly lays half a million eggs, Typical year, one or two might survive. Maybe that year, 10 or 100 survive for each female. When you add them all up, those yeah. are the good years, right? Uh, and 2020, 2021, 2022, good years. And then big flooding. 
and in the Murray in the Southern Basin. Because the last big flood was five years ago, we've got a hypoxic blackwater event again because there's five years of build-up. And in the Darling, we've now seen hypoxic flows as well. So that, that variability that we talked about that used to be there would be in the, in the mid-Murray section, which is if anyone's ever been to Echuca, think about that part of the world, have a look at how high those wharves are. That tells you how variable the river used to be when they were loading wool and stuff on and off boats. The, um, there's a bunch of red gum forest there, which should be a clue. If there's a red gum forest, that means it flooded regularly. Red gum like to flood, but they don't like to be underwater all the time. <clears throat> so that mid-Murray region used to flood every year maybe two years at But that's a pinch. good in my eyes. Absolutely good. And you said something there because we hadn't had a flow five years before that this this latest fish kill. Yep. Had we had floods and that water got up on those flood plains, it would have washed out a lot of that Regularly. organic, organic yep. matter that that's meant that when we had the latest flood, yep. you, you get the natural black water event and they are natural, aren't they? It, they're uh, an, it's a natural that, It's a natural phenomenon, phenomenon but yep. they are exacerbated it's, by... The flow regime, the altered flow regime. Right. So this idea that you hear black water, you go, oh, my God. Well, no, that, that's been happening for millions of years. It's this idea that we're, we're because we're not getting the, the variability in the, these pulses and the, the water up on the floodplains more constantly to yep. kind of wash out all the debris, yep. when they do happen and we're five years apart, they're big. They're big. They're, uh, and there's a few analogies here. One of them is uh, mowing your lawn, right? Mm. If you, in summer, if you don't mow your lawn every week or two weeks and you come back to it after four weeks, it's going to be bloody hard to mow because everything's, like, there's a heap of growth. Or, um, uh, well, that's probably going off. I don't like using the analogy of fires because people think, well, why don't you burn the forest? But if you don't do controlled burns regularly, then when you do get a bushfire, it's disastrous, right? Yep. So much fuel to burn. It's the same sort of concept that the the leaves and grasses and stuff on, on a floodplain next to a river is fuel. When you get it, chuck it in water, just like you chuck a tea bag in water, it starts to dissolve and the water goes brown. If you have a lot of it, it might even go black, which is what's called black water. Again, that's not bad. That's what is driving the food web in our river system. That's nutrients. That's, that's food. Nutrients. That's yep. carbon, man. Carbon is the stuff. But if you have too much Essentially, you're overdosing the system because it hasn't been fed every year. You're just waiting for five years, then you give it five years' worth of food. Well, the first thing that happens is that stuff dissolves on mass. Water goes really black, and there's bacteria and microbes in the river, which I don't know if Marty spoke about this, but their job is to process that dissolved carbon and nutrients and turn it into bacteria, which then gets eaten by bigger microbes, which gets eaten by tiny bugs and plankton and so on. Bacteria go, this is great, look at all this food. They just start multiplying and multiplying. And in doing so, they use oxygen. And there's more and more of them. You can't see them, but their mass must be enormous. And they suck the oxygen out of the system, which fish are trying to get a, a gob full of oxygen and they're struggling because the bacteria are using up as as much as they can to process all this fuel. Don't they, doesn't that all sit in the top of the water column? Uh, no, it's kind of all the way through it in the flood. Right. But you get algae in the top of the water column yep. where there's light and they're that's another stressor because algae are essentially aquatic grass. They're plants. When the sun's shining, they'll produce oxygen. When it's not shining, they won't produce oxygen, but they will use it yep. to breathe. So algae are also consuming the oxygen that those bacteria are trying to use. And essentially more things, including fish, are trying to use the oxygen than there is oxygen being produced. Um, if you had a, a regular flush every year or two, well, then that load of fuel would be smaller each time, mm. right? Um, so it is like a bit like controlled burns to, to prevent a massive fire being enormous. Never heard of the tea bag analogy. It's a bloody good one. Yeah, yeah, well, That's good, but no one's drinking a tea with five tea bags in it. No, well, it is like that, yeah. So if you go one tea bag every year, you've got a nice cup of tea. Mm. If you go wait 10 years, throw all 10 in. You're not drinking that. And then the Murray, which suffers the most from this, um, used to flood in late winter, spring, snow melt, rainfall yep. season, because we captured a lot of that rain in the dams now. If there is a flood, it's usually a month or two later yep. when it's hotter. Tea bags work better in hot water than they do cold water, right? So you put your 10 tea bags in cold water, it's worse than one. But if you put them in hot water, it's a lot worse than one tea bag in cold water. And that's the colour's worse and that's in, the colour's not what kills stuff, right? 
but you, you're spot on when you say the black water's not bad. Black water's okay. Mm. We need it to fuel the system, but if it's an overdose, not so no good. No good. I'm interested to hear more a little bit about specific species and their relationship with flow or maybe a lack of, you know, and, yep. and particularly ones that are now considered threatened because of that. Now, one of the ones that your colleagues have thrown you under the bus here with is the the Murray Hardy head. Murray Hardy head. Um, yep. Obviously, there's there's many we can talk about, but I'm interested in talking about the ones that probably don't get a lot of the mainstream, you know, the yep. attention. So, so what yeah. Are, yeah, I guess let's chat on them first and then talk about their relationship well, with flow. To get to them, the, an easy way to think about it is we break fish into different groups that have different flow requirements. And Martin Mallon Cooper spoke about this. You've got those flow specialists like golden perch, silver perch. They need a flow to get them to move and breed. You've got things that like your flowing water like your Murray cod, but they'll breed every year regardless, Murray cod, catfish. And then we've got these little things that we call floodplain species and Murray hardy head are one of those. And those are things that have over time adapted to live in, in the habitats outside the main channel or on the fringes in the backwaters where the water's not flowing, but it, it gets there regularly through floods and, and freshens it up, right? Murray hardy head, are a little species that do that. They live in, in the wetlands of the basin uh, and they would have lived in wetlands dotted all around the floodplain. So I've done this before, looked at Mildura on a map and gone, there, 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 there. Right. At some stage, Murray Hardy here would live in these places. They're really interesting because they're super salt tolerant, right, which means they were living way out on the fridges of the floodplain where groundwater was coming up and you can get, you might, most people won't get this, but you can get salinity levels in the Murray-Darling Basin that are twice as salty or more as the ocean. Just because you get this, the salt comes up from the groundwater and yep. it just concentrates and then the water evaporates away and then more comes up and you just concentrate the salt and it gets saltier and saltier. You've had people in the Dead Sea, you can swim there and just... Yeah, yeah you just float. That sort of thing, right? Right. In Australia, in the Murray-Darling Basin, murray Hardy Head can tolerate double the salinity of seawater. They don't necessarily like it. But they can tolerate it. They can tolerate it. So in a big drought, historically, they're the only ones living in these nasty mm. pieces of brown, brackish water, thriving, full of mosquito and midge larvae, gobbing them down. And every two or three years, typically, or every year, there's a flood, that, and if it connects with them, well, they come back in. So many, so much goodies in the water that they don't really have to compete anyway. Everyone gets a free feed disperse up and down and then the flood goes past and if you landed in a spot that gets a bit salty you beauty you're going to dominate in another year that's their thing and that's dependent on a variable flow regime that a keeps enough water in those places so they don't dry out completely so you need a flood every three to five years at least but also doesn't flood so often that you're super fresh like a typical billabong where everybody else wants to be there and you've got to compete hard for food and you're probably not going to make it and you get eaten by predators. So they've found that niche on the edge of the floodplain or on the salty bits, um, which is why they're threatened. Because, because they're not getting the water that they used to, on the pulses that we're not, talking about. Or if you live, like you think about Mildura, and I mentioned that weir at Mildura, if you're a Murray Hardy head and you live downstream of Mildura, you're not getting the flows high enough anymore because the weir's moderating them and you dry out and you die, you're gone. If you live upstream of Mildura, your billabong, which 300 years ago used to disconnect regularly and get salty, it's permanently connected now and it's fresh all the time, full of carp, full of other fish. You're not going to survive there. So they've tended to persist just in a couple of pockets where, ironically, because of the way humans have managed water, we flood irrigate and the water that came off the other end used to go into these disposal basins. That's where they're surviving. Until now. And so, so that variability in salinity, we come back to it. Yep. Again, it's whole, you've introduced this concept that I think so many people are lacking in their understanding that variability is so big. The variability in salinity is important for this species, my hardy head. And it's linked to variability in flow. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. And that's typical of most of the wetland species. These guys are different because they like the salty stuff. Mm. The purple spotted cudgeons, pygmy perch. Same deal. Same deal, but they just, they like the floodplain areas that disconnect and are full of plants for a while, but those now have been dominated by carp for 
50 years. Right, so there's another problem. Another problem. Every time there's a flow that connects them, like we could, we could and we do, we work with the, the water holders to pump water into a, a wetland to make sure we don't get carp in it, put a screen on it, make sure the water's clean, comes in. We can put some plants in there, we can put some habitat in there, some logs, uh, and we can reintroduce fish to it. When the flow next floods and reconnects that, which is what used to help them spread around, mm. it's going to put carp straight back yeah. in there, right? So the one thing you did to make it, you know, to make it a good wetland or whatever yeah. is very quickly undone. And this is why threatened species management is really difficult for some of these guys. It's the same as for mammals. They've got to create fenced-off areas and kill all the pests in it, all the mm. foxes, and then start. That's okay for that little bit. But if you open it up so they can spread wider, well, then they're at the mercy of yep. foxes, they're at the mercy of traffic. What's your opinion on the argument that we should just start living with some of these invasives and just accept it? Uh, if they kill off a bunch of species, see you later. We we have to live with them because there's generally no way of getting rid of everything altogether. Mm. And the carp argument, there's discussion around using the carp herpes virus. It won't kill all of them, but the same way that myxomatosis didn't kill all the rabbits. But it knocked them down. It knocked them down enough to do other measures um, like some. So I guess with the rabbit analogy, other measures included actually targeting the rabbit warrens to keep the numbers down, other measures to control them, which gave native animals and grasses a chance to actually come back a bit. It'd be the same with carp, with ideally knock them down a bit, free up some resources for some of the native fish. Um, a few less water plants would get ripped up before they can even get started and a bit more plankton would emerge from sediments and floodplains before it got swallowed by a carp. Knocking them back and then other programs on top of it, whether it's a virus or whether it's some other measure, but um, they're not going anywhere. Mm. They're going to be there. You're right. They're there for the long term. Right. Um, we've just got to try it. Well, we put them there, right, humans, us. Mm. It's up to us to try and control them to the point where we don't lose everything else. Because of us. Yeah. What's this idea of, of breaking up the measures into or breaking up the requirements of a healthy river into, you know, mandatory, complementary, yeah. whatever. Let's I think, you know, I'm I'm obviously I'm I, you know, I'm with Oldsfish, right? A huge, huge advocate. They do a lot of uh riparian restoration, re-snagging, rocky um habitat habitats, works. Yep. habitat works, uh all the way through to um shellfish, yep. seagrass, all that, right? We're putting things back. Yep. Sometimes I see that and I go, well, that's great, but what if it got knocked out tomorrow? You know, you put yep. all, you do all this hard work and then it, it's – I really want to know, and I don't know this because I don't know what I don't know yet, but I really want to know that what, what we're doing isn't just going to be undone tomorrow, yep. if that makes sense. No, it, it, it does, and there's a term that you mentioned before, complementary measures, right, which is in nerd speak, those are things like – adding habitat or protecting habitat, planting trees, snags, fish ladders, addressing cold water pollution. They're called complementary measures because they complement something, right? They they work well hand in hand with something. And the something is flow. The something is water use, water delivery, the way water flows. So that the thing called the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, and people have heard about that, they've heard about water buybacks or the environmental water in a nutshell – that's that's trying to restore some of the flow variability that we've talked about. That's the fundamental must-have issue you asked me before, mm. not negotiable. If we don't get that and we don't stop rivers from drying up that aren't meant to dry up by using flow wisely and working with the environment rather than against it, doesn't matter how many snags you put in or how many trees you plant, if the flowing water habitat is not there, the fish won't be there. Mm. No matter how many fish you stock, if the habitat's not there to support them growing up and surviving, and in this case I'm describing flowing water as habitat, mm -hmm. if it's not there, you're stocking fish that aren't going to survive. Right. So the fundamental thing, and that's not necessarily Ausfish's job, right? Mm. That's definitely not what you do. That's what governments are about and scientists and agencies. We've got to repair the flow regime. We've got to refine it. We've got to make it more suitable to animals and plants that need to be there. 
and still work that river so that the country can prosper. What you've said is, is given me a sense of optimism in the sense that, let's say, let's go back to a history scale, hundreds of years, right? Yep. River goes up, river goes down, river goes up, river goes down, good years, bad years, blah, blah, blah. If we could restore the flow to what is considered a good level of amount of flow, good variability, whatever, yep. we could just treat this little 150-year period that we've completely cocked up as, you know, just one of those periods. We could. And when it gets back up to what it could be, just like the river did all those other times, yep. it would just go, okay, well, that was a bad time, now we're in a good time type thing, you know what I mean? Like, if Some things will recover real quick, mm. right, purely because they've adapted to boom bust, right, and if they can hold on, if you could flick a switch tomorrow mm. and get a utopia where um, – what the science and the conservationists want, you've got a decent flowing river with some variability. The mouth of the Murray is open, doesn't need to be dredged. Top to bottom, small streams, cold streams, hot streams, all that stuff is functioning. Most organisms that are still there will recover and come back. They'll do even better if we can control carp somewhat. They'll do even better if we add more habitat Habitat. and if we do all those other things, address yep. cold water pollution. So that, they I mean, they go hand in hand. If you ask a, a business person that's got three things threatening their business, uh, just deal with that one. Well, that's the fundamental one. But if I deal with all three of them, mm. if I don't deal with all three of them, I'm not staying in business. It's common sense. You do all these together. That's what the, the reason I'm, I'm harping on about the word complementary is because a lot of people just revert to the, oh, well, why don't we, why don't we, control carp and as an offset we'll just recover less water or deliver less water well why don't we build a few fishways which means we'll need less water you still need the flying habitat right they complement the flying habitat Mm -hmm. and it's it's, it might it is very difficult right because water is precious in it and we use it for a bunch of reasons and we need to use it wisely I think I've thought of an analogy for you go for it because you're good at them am I I want to I want to start being a good what, what would you call it? An analogizer. Go for it. A pizza. A pizza. You tell me to make a margarita pizza, right? Yep. You give me a base. Yep. It's not a margarita pizza. No. The pizza. You give me some cheese. It's nearly there. It's not a margarita pizza. But then you're adding all these other layers to it, and it's not until you add yes. the basil on top. <laughs> yes. You get your margarita a, pizza. I've, I've got, it's Do dynamic. I work on that? It's yeah. dynamic. Yeah. yeah, good try. Mm. I'll keep working. Keep on working that. on it. Yeah, you got yeah. to do. It. Well, I need, I, I, we need to think of some analogies. Anyone listening has got a good analogy. Please so let us know. There's and there's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. That and it's kind of a reverse analogy, mm. a revalogy. I don't know. Just making words nice. up now. Yeah. Good. And and a lot of people fall back on. There was a famous poem by Dorothy McKenna or someone back in the day. Um, I love a sunburnt country. Mm. Yada yada yada. Classic poem. Um, a land of droughts and flooding rains, mm. as though, which is right. And she was a teenager in England missing home when she wrote that, right? They'd just come out of a couple of bad droughts in the basin, dust bowl stuff. Um, that, that's a good explanation of the boom and bust nature, but it doesn't excuse us compounding those problems. Just because Dorothy McKenna, a teenager, wrote a really cool poem that's romantic and makes us all feel Australian, doesn't mean we can pretend we're not having an impact. We can't just go, ah, it's just a drought or it's just a flood. Mm. We've made them so much worse in that 25 centimetres, right? And so as much as I like that poem, I want to, I want people to stop hanging on to it as... <laughs> Write a new poem. Or put a few new paragraphs in, like yep. a land of droughts and flooding rains and, and if we bury our heads in dead fish, mm. try and absolve ourselves of blame. Yeah, oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Not so good. I'll probably get canned for that one. But yeah, I mean that's that's what I, I mean. I get what you I get you what you're picking up. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's not it's not as simple as, as blaming nature. Yeah. Because if you want to blame nature, she's going to come back and kick your ass. Mm, I think it's really interesting that whole thing around. Well, I wasn't aware of it, but this this idea of booms and busts, this idea that the river went up and down and up and down, and we're really kind of stopping mm. that. I think that's that's a big one. So to kind of round out the the. the the Murray Hardy Head is it? Do you reckon it's called the Hardy Head for a reason because they're so uh, resilient to some pretty hard and conditions? They should. It? It, yeah, it works for them. I think they're called Hardy Heads because they're related to some a group of fishes called the Hardy Heads mm. that are traditionally ocean. Like yeah, right. White bait. Yep. I think well, that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, there's a couple of really special species in Australia, mm. and and in the basin there's that one, but 
Um, they are bloody hardy and, and they'll persist, as I said, in those really nasty brackish places where everything else will die. We actually use that in managing them. We we let places where we've we've established populations of these things, but in flood or whatever, carp will get in there. Well, we let it get salty enough. We let the evaporation make it salty enough that all the carp die. Because the, you know their um, hardy head will survive. Yeah, and a month later, bang, they'll go berserk and there'll be wow. millions of them. So we've gone a little, little wetland, a little three kilometre long out um, near the South Australian border that a couple of landowners said, hey, hardy head dude, I reckon you like this one. Mm. And I had a look at it and went, I love this one. <laughs> and the... The, the environmental water managers said, yeah, we can get water to that if you want it. You just tell us when and how much because it's only little. Mm. Um, put some water in it. looked fantastic, full of food. Pinched some hardy heads from South Australia. When we were working with our friends over there. Chuck them in. Pop them in. 800 fish. Went back three months later. And that's in a three-kilometre mm. wetland, 100 metres wide. 800 fish. We went back with nine little nets. We got, I think, 5,000, right? Just in your nets. Yeah, which means there's... There's already ten. tens to hundreds of thousands have gone berserk. And then after a small flood put some water in it and then the flood receded and the carp died because it got salty, I my nets were just a sausage of Murray Hardy head and I reckon there were 200,000 fish in one net. 200,000 threatened fish. Isn't that, well, you've got, you're have got onto something, yeah. Yeah, it works for them. Mm. If only that was simple for everything else. Mm. Right? But as I said, we can use salt to manage wow. those guys. But we nearly lost them. Millennium drought, we nearly lost them. Yep. Um, but now, what would you? What would your response to say when I say this? You know, why? Why do we need them? Why are they important? Why yeah. should I care? I can't eat them. Can't catch them. Uh, well, if nothing else, they keep mosquito numbers down. Really? Yeah. But yeah. the old, most of the old adage of um, they're a canary in the coal mine. If we're losing those things that are super tough and have taken millions of years to evolve to the variability of the system, and they're starting to die, and everything else is starting to decline. Mm. At what point do you say, okay, we don't care about hardy heads. They're not really any use to us. What's next in line? Yeah, a pygmy perch, they're gone from the basin. There's a few in some farm dams. And then this one, then this one. Then all of a sudden people will start saying, oh, you don't see Barney Brim very much anymore. Mm -hmm. used to be, they the things that died on the millions. Well, they're basically pelican food and Murray Cod food. So the, the more you let it get Eventually out of control. Eventually you get to Murray Cod. Slippery slope, man. It's very slippery slope. Once one goes, they all go. They can do, yeah. Dominoes. Wow. I'm just throwing analogies at your left, right, I love center. it. Dodging them. It's dominoes on a slippery slope. <laughs> <laughs> Two. <laughs> can you compile any more? Um, no, that's been great. Look, it's a, it's a topic that I think uh, deserves um, a little bit more attention, particularly in how we explain it to some of our wreck fishing audiences and our, you know, not just wreck fishing, but just any any – uh, you know, kind of anyone who uses that waterway or, or mm. around that whole idea of flow and variability and, and flow isn't just the idea of throwing an apple core in, in the river and, and not seeing it there in three minutes' time. It's a it's all these different types of flow and how they all kind yep. of work for fish where it be um, golden swimming upstream and spawning and letting their larvae drift down through to the cod, you know, not having to move as much to get their food. I think that whole story is a really important one. I think you've done well yeah, to, well, to, to really get that out. It, it's tricky because wreck fishers just want to catch a fish, yeah, mm. but they're interested enough to give up their weekend to go and plant trees, clear rubbish. Like mm. Oz fish are cracking at this. They're interested enough to give up their time and help out, which means if, if they understood the fundamentals that, that drove fish being in the rivers in big numbers, they're going to start – giving up their time to actually write a few letters as well and say, well, we're doing our bit. Mm. Government, what are you doing? Your job is the flow. Get it right because we're doing our bit. Yep. And um, if everyone does their bit. Yeah. Be good. Go on, give me something, an analogy. It's a very, very tasty pizza. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, that's kind of all I wanted to cover today. There's a good hour on flow there. Um, full letter word, very significant. Who would have thought? Um, if there's nothing else you want to... Cover. It's been an absolute pleasure. No, no um, great to be here. Hopefully we get another one out, another Ozcast um, with Ian. Um, you're on your way back down to Mildura, I'm sure. I'm heading to the coast, but hopefully our paths align again. They will. In the meantime. No keep it up, man. It was good. Sounds good. Thanks, mate. Thank you. This episode of Ozcast is proudly supported by the Australian Government's Environment Restoration Fund, the Australian Government through the CRC program, and BCF, Boating, Camping, Fishing.